Hi, I'm Sean Duggan, and welcome to The Fix, the podcast about Photoshop, Lightroom, post-processing, and all the cool and creative things that we get to do with our images after the shoot. My guest this week is Vincent Versace, and he's going to be taking us on a conceptual deep dive into the subtle and nuanced world of digital black and white. Well, thanks for tuning in and joining me as always. So I'm really pleased to have Vincent Versace as my guest today. Vincent is a very accomplished photographer. He is one of the founding members of the Nikon Ambassador Program, and he's also done a lot of work uh, with Epson, and he uh, was uh, very instrumental in the development of Nick Silver Effects Pro. He's also the author of Welcome to Oz, a cinematic approach to digital still photography, and from Oz to Kansas, almost every black and white technique known to man. So Vincent, thank you for joining me. Good to have you. Well, thank you for having me and it's good to be here. So apropos um, black and white, I know that that is uh, a a passion of yours uh, that is pretty important to your creative life. Is that not true? Um, I started as a black and white photographer. My love and penchant for photography is rooted in a black and white tradition. I'm a, by training a large format black and white photographer that did a two-step development process and had an archival black and white darkroom. So I'm really focused on black and white. It's been my great, it's my greatest love in photography. Yeah, that's how, that's how, you know, I first got into photography too, was the traditional black and white darkroom and, you know, tray developing my own prints and tank, small tank developing my film. And in fact, I still do small tank developing for my pinhole camera, but, uh, uh, haven't done tray developing in a while. Digital has taken me away from that. <laughs> my my suggestion to you, young man, is to get into replenishment development. If you want the smoothest, prettiest negatives, uh, D76 replenishment. That gives you the prettiest. But um, it stinks. Yeah, I know. that That is the problem. But, you know... Um... Well, that, that, that's another story. You know, I'll, <laughs> I'll do another show about my pinhole photography and, and developing negatives. This is all about post-processing. But before we get into talking about uh, developing black and white, um, I know you've got some, uh, some workshops coming up. You've got a workshop in Cuba coming up. Is that true? I do have a workshop in Cuba coming up, and I have, actually have a black and white workshop at the Palm Beach Photographic Center. Um, both of which the Cuba workshop is in March on the 18th, led by Palm Beach. Um, and the black and white workshop is also um, in uh, at Palm Beach Photographic Center, where you and I are when this gets aired. Exactly. When this gets aired, you and I will be at Photo Fusion uh, down at the Palm Beach Photographic uh, Workshop. And uh, it's been a couple of years since I've been there, so I'm, I'm looking forward to being back there and, and seeing seeing all the people that I only see there at PhotoFusion and uh, doing some sessions. So that'll be cool. Look forward to it. Look forward to hanging yeah. out. Yeah, that'd be great. So uh, let's talk about black and white in terms of um, a conceptual approach uh, for maybe things to, to keep in mind when, when people are, are photographing with the aim to create a black and white image. And then, you know, we can segue on into uh, how somebody might approach processing black and white and um, if the opportunity presents itself and seems appropriate you can also dive into a screen share and uh, demo some stuff if if that would be helpful sure I'm set up to do that um, I guess the best way for me to start is I get asked three questions first can you see in black and white second how come my black and whites don't look like your black and whites? And third, can you teach me how to see in black and white? And I'm going to try and answer those three questions. The, the issue I think at hand is one of we're now in a digital world and digital is considerably different than film with regards to the way in which the image is captured and that black and white isn't really black and white when you're printing it with an, an inkjet printer. It's a color image. 
Right. There are col color inks involved. So I think it's more appropriate to refer to them as chromatic grayscales from a conceptual standpoint, because equal values of red, green, and blue produce gray. So that in and of itself, there's a quote I want to read too. Let me give it to you. Um, this is from Ansel Adams in his book, The Print, his last uh, uh, editing of it. Quote, I eagerly await new concepts and processes. I believe that the electronic image will be the next major advance. Such systems will have their own inherent and inescapable structural characteristics, and the artist and functional practitioner will again strive to comprehend and control them. And I think the point here is that if Ansel Adams was alive today, he would be a digital black and white photographer. Sure, so yeah. All of this, um, for lack of a better word, I'm gonna use the Yiddish uh, way of saying it, Chazerai, um, about what the reality of, of black and white is. If arguably the god of black and white photography says he wishes he was alive to be an electronic photographer. Right. Um, because that's what he was back in the day. I mean, he was instrumental in the development of Polaroid film. He's the one that got um, Dr. Land to produce the black and white negative positive Polaroid film. So he was all on the bleeding edge of this. And if you look at it, we can do more today in chromatic grayscale than we ever could do. I mean, uh, Epson just released a printer that has out of the box a DMAX of an L star of two, which I love that that sounds like I've just said something important. Sounds like um, a science, science fiction film, L star right. two. L star two. What that means is L in LAB, luminance, is you can go down to a, a black density of two. Zero is theoretical. One doesn't exist on the planet. Right. So we have the ability now to push a dynamic range past zone two into zone one. Yeah. So. Well, you know, well I was going to say that a Ansel you know, understood the role that technology always played in photography. Photography has always been a, uh, a blending of art and technology. And Ansel understood that technology had a big part in that. And he understood that technology changes and evolves. So that's why he knew that, yes, one of these days, you know, probably after he was gone, there would be, um, you know, electronic imaging and we would be working with the electronic or the digital image. And that's why I think he was, you know, open to that idea. Well, the level of control that I can have now, I never could have in my archival dark, dark room. So I'm all for it. You know, I, I think that the argument with regards to film versus digital really comes down to, do you like the metallic look of silver paper versus the not so metallic look of digital photography? It's an aesthetic choice on the output. It's not an argument as to which can capture better. We have yeah. cameras now that do 14 stops of dynamic range. The zone system only calls for 10 and only actually realistically uses seven. So, yeah. so with that, we have the ability to push into the lower zones and still hold detail in the upper zones. So, you know, from an artistic, aesthetic, creative standpoint, I can do more now today than I ever could in a dark room. And I mean, I'm a classically trained black and white printer. I'm a better printer than I am a photographer. And again, going back to Ansel Adams, he said, the greatest photographers in the world are always the greatest printers, but the greatest printers are not necessarily the greatest photographers. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you, ha you have to understand the whole enchilada, the middle, the beginning and the end. It's like, the way I conceptualize it is that you're traveling a circle in a straight line. Oh, how zen of me. Um, <laughs> Let me, wait a minute, let me, let me put that on Twitter right now. <laughs> yeah. Yes. You know, Buddhist monk Zen Versace says, um, <laughs> no, it's right. Every decision you need to make about the image happens at point of capture, right? And the more you understand about the middle, the more informed decisions can be at point of capture. And everything you do is in service of the print, but the print is in service of your voice, which happens where? at point of capture. Right. So every, everything is in this circle, but it's a linear experience. Mm -hmm. So what do I think? I think that you should understand Photoshop. I think that black and white chromatic grayscale photography is best done in Photoshop. Lightroom or any raw processor for that matter, be it phase one Lightroom, DxO, 
NXD, any of them, is not the best place to do a black and white conversion because you don't have control of the three color channels. Right. So the key is ownership of the color. He, she, or it who owns color wins in an image. And um, the artist Matisse said, if you can see it with your eye, it's a color. And Renoir said that in the 40 years of my life that I've been trying to disprove this, the only thing that I know is that black is the queen of all color. I love that quote. Yeah. And it's like a little bit of white paint goes a long way. That's Matisse too. So if you keep those things and Maisel, I just saw a video that Jay talked about and he's spot on. It's like, where should you go to learn about photography? Should you look at a 200 year tradition or should you look, or should you look at a thousands, tens of thousands of years tradition, which is art? Yeah. So look, look at painting, look at the way the great masters use it. They didn't have rules of thirds. They didn't have all this stuff that we've piled on to photography. Right. You know, my rules of photography are simple. If it looks cool, take a picture of it. Yeah. Okay. Still photographs called a still photograph because the picture doesn't move. Not because the objects in the picture are not in motion. Your job is to stop motion with stillness. And lastly, consciously choose to use the whole frame or consciously choose to not use the whole frame, but be conscious about it. And in, and, and in terms of, uh, of photographing with black and white in mind, um, a lot of people think that there's something special that they should be doing at the camera end of things when they're photographing. Uh, but really, you just want to f make a good photograph, a well-exposed photograph that has, obviously, all the exposure information you need. But beyond that, I mean, you know, you're, you're starting, with digital anyway, you're starting with a color photograph. You're always starting, and you want to start with a color image. You don't want to, I mean, again, the, the, the whole issue here is that black and white digital photography is like opposite day and groundhog day in that... <laughs> Things that you think would make sense make no sense. For example, yes, this is an absolute written in stone rule. Get it right in the camera at point of capture as much as possible. Yeah. Except with black and white. So logic would say, well, set it in monochrome mode, right? Because you're getting it right in the camera. The issue there is that the way monochrome works in all cameras um, is that you take the green channel and then you replicate it to the red and the blue. So what did you accomplish there? Well, the, the main thing that I don't like about that is that I'm ceding control, a huge amount of creative control about how the image looks to an algorithm in the camera. A not, even, algorithm. not even an algorithm. You're just taking the luminance, green, and yeah. dumping the red and the blue. So you're losing two-thirds of the file's data. Right. And a and, and way that you could, you could massage that data to create an entirely different result. Right. Because if we look at the difference between film and digital, which is film is logarithmic which means that it's non-linear and digital is linear therefore non-logarithmic and what that means is that if i had two colors a yellow and a pink let's say and they were both the same luminance if i photograph them in film they'd be two grays mm -hmm. if i photograph them in digital they would be the same gray if i removed all the color so which way do i want to go trick question yeah. <laughs> Keep in mind, it's opposite day. I want to go with the, lin non, the linear, not the no non-linear, because it's predictable and I can control it. Right, right. Which means that I have access to the red, the green, and the blue channel. So the big secret to black and white photography and digital is make an incredible color image. The gesture of the image, because there are four elements. Maisel says there are three. I say there are four. So uh, I can't leave well enough alone. His are light color and gesture. Mine are right. right gesture in time. So the gesture of the image is so strong that color becomes a distraction to it. That's mm -hmm. really the decider as to what makes a black and white image for me or not, is right. that the gesture is so strong in the picture that the color takes away from it. Um, because you can hide behind color. If I had a, a picture of a dozen red roses and I spritzed a little water on them and three dead fish wrapped in newspaper and took a <laughs> color picture of it and then did it archivally and then mounted it on, you know, rag board and put it in a frame. You'd go, oh, my God, look at those roses. But if I right. took that same picture and simply removed all the color from it, you'd go, what's with the gray fish and the gray roses? Mm -hmm. 
because the gesture is not strong, the color overpowers it. And then it becomes more about the color than the gesture. So that's right. right. You know, all this nonsense about it must have contrast. It must have the, no, it must be a good photograph. Yeah. Well, that's, that's for for any, any photography, you know, a a good photograph to start out with. Uh, But, but there are, um, I mean, there are certain, um, certain types of, of scenes and, and processing that, um, uh, work better in black and white. I mean, well, yeah, there's, yeah. All right. For example, I have a photograph of the uh, Golden Gate Bridge that I shot at high noon with the fog coming in and I was in the Berkeley Hills. So I was above the fog line foc- focusing down on it. Mm-hmm. So what I have is I have a bald blue sky and fog coming in, which in color, the picture absolutely sucks. Yeah. But if I take the red channel and use that as the primary, it turns the sky black. And what happens is I have a very dramatic photograph at a crappy time of day. So yeah, in that instance, and that's when, again, Ansel Adams trick, he used to use a red filter and a polarizer when he had a bald sky. Right. So the, again, also the gesture of the fog and the bridge is being taken away from by the color in the image. Right. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But, you know, another thing that that I always think about um, when I am both processing my own black and white images and also, you know, teaching other people is that I see a lot of uh, black and white conversions where it's, it's pretty obvious that somebody has just converted it to black and white and done nothing beyond that. And so... One thing that gets lost if you just sort of convert an image to black and white is that it loses that color contrast that was created by all the different colors in the image. So it kind of gets a little bit flat. Oh, yeah. Well, there's, there's different channels hold different detail. Sure. So, um, you know, the problem is this. I can use a, an analogy with wine. A bottle of wine is um, 80% water, 17% alcohol, um, or 12 to 17% alcohol, um, a couple of percent tannins, malic acid, sugars, tartrates, bug parts, stuff, and 2% diffused aromatic gas. Mm-hmm. It's the 2% diffused aromatic gas that gives the wine 100% of its flavor. If I remove the color completely out of the picture, okay, I can meet the definition of a black and white image. Actually, let me show you with a demo. May I? Yes, let's dive into your screen share. All right, so what we have to do is we have to come up with what is a working definition of what is a chromatic grayscale or black and white image um, in silver photography. So what it will be, my definition of it, is a black or paper black in, in film, a middle gray and white of paper in both digital and film, and a grayscale wrap in between. And since you speak for your audience, do you and your audience agree to that? Uh, well, that seems like a, a fair description to me, yes. All right, so it's a black and white and a middle gray. Now, do we agree that the RGB, red, green, blue, and the CMYK are different colors? Uh, yes, they definitely uh, have the appearance of being different colors, I would say so. All right, so I'm at 100% or 255 red, 255 green, 255 blue. If you look in the lower left-hand corner in the info palette, and I'm at the equivalent of what would be 100% cyan, yellow, and magenta. So the colors are different. I've got a grayscale ramp. I have a zero black, a 128, 128, 128, middle gray, and a um, pure white. Asked, um, so let me just- yeah, let me just clarify for those who may be listening to the audio only version of this. So, so you've got some uh, color sampler points uh, displaying in your info panel in Photoshop there. Uh, you have one for the red, uh, uh, one for the, the green, and one for the blue. And then obviously you have one, number four, is set on um, a gray value, a neutral middle gray value. Right, for whatever reason, it's not showing up, but the red, green, and blue are here, and the gray value is here. Or here. Uh, I, I see. Right. On the right. Okay. Great. So, right. so two fifty five red is one hundred percent red. Two fifty five bl- green is one hundred percent green, etc. Right. And the middle gray is one hundred twenty eight. Right. All right. E- now, equal, equal numbers of red, green, and blue makes neutral gray in an RGB image. Correct. 
So equal number numbers of RGB equal gray. Right. Because you are dealing with red, green, blue, and you're printing with ink if you print digitally. So now film is logarithmic, therefore nonlinear, and digital is linear, therefore non-logarithmic. And what that means is this. Human beings and human perception is logarithmic. If I were to take a 16 ounce cup of coffee and put a pack of sugar in it, it would taste sweet. If I put two packs of sugar in it, it wouldn't taste twice as sweet, it would just taste sweeter. Mm -hmm. In a linear world, two packets of sugar would make it taste twice as sweet. Right. Okay, now, if I do what we have all done to produce a black and white image, that, I meet my definition, don't I? Yes. But something evil just happened, didn't it? Yes, we have lost the differences between the colors. We, but, we, right, but we've met our definition. Yes. Okay, and therein lies what you would think, oh no, I want a, a logarithmic way of doing it. No, here's where it becomes opposite day. You don't want that because this is predictable. And, and let me just interject something again here for, for those who might be listening to the audio version. What Vincent did was in the hue saturation panel, he has an adjustment layer, and he just dialed down the saturation and removed all the color saturation from the image. But that caused the uh, red, green, and blue grid and the CMY grid to just lose all definition so it doesn't look like a checkerboard of different colors anymore or even different tonal values it looks totally gray correct now it's so everything but it meets the definition and herein lies the problem i can get 95 98 percent to where i need to go simply by removing all of the color or all of the saturation out of the color right the problem is what i do is i destroy the relationship the spectral relationship between red green and blue, which film could capture. And back in the day, we picked films based on what it is they did. Let me show you, for example, this is what T-Max 100 would look like. Do you notice that the grays are all different? Mm -hmm. Okay, this is HP 5 Plus, my favorite film, second favorite film in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, I used to rate HP 5 Plus at 200 instead of 400 and then use a replenishment development system to um, get a mellow grain structure where I could take a 35 millimeter negative and blow it up to 20 by 24, which back in the day was virtually unheard of ability to do. All right. So this is FP4. You see the difference between these two Ilford films? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Okay. This is AGFA APX 100. That's a profound difference between this. Yeah. And that's a big difference between that. You see how these colors shift? Yeah. So depending on the scene value, I would pick a different film. What, I'm, what am I walking into? Now, this is my favorite film in the entire world. It was a sad day when they got rid of Panatomic X, which was the finest grain film you could work with. And this is T-Max 400 which if you look at it is extremely different, not extremely, but very different from T-Max 100. So all these different films did different things and you would pick these different films based on what it is you would be doing. For example, T-Max 100, I used to use a, a lot for um, landscape. HP 5 Plus, I used exclusively for doing Hollywood portraiture. Mm -hmm. I can see that, yeah. Okay, Panatomic X, back in the day, was exclusively for landscape. I used this first, then had, was forced to T-Max 100. I'd also use Tri-X rated at 320, but Panatomic X for me was, you know, the end-all, be-all for film. And T-Max 400 I never used because it was just, it was too grainy for me. So... I would pick different films because they did different things. Now, the problem here is let's take a look at, um, let's go look at an image. One sec, let me pull up an image. All right. 
Let's take a look at the lovely Shaolin Cates, my favorite person to photograph. I remember that image, yeah. Yes, this was done for a biopic on Gene Harlow, and I was tasked with photographing the lost contact sheet of George Harrell. Ah. So what you're looking at is an image that is completely lit with sunlight. Nice. Now, let's look at the channels. This is the red channel. Yes or no, does this meet our definition of a black and white image or chromatic grayscale? Um, well, it certainly would meet the definition of a, of a black and white image. Uh, I would say since it's only one channel, it, I wouldn't think it would meet chromatic grayscale. No, but it's got a black, a white, and a middle gray, and a grayscale ramp in between. Does it meet yes. that definition? Okay. Yes, definitely. A as do all of the channels. Does this? Yes. And it does this. Now, yes. they all meet the definition. Are they all different? Indeed. All right. So this is creamier skin tone. Mm -hmm. This contains all the midtone data and the luminance of the image. And this contains the lower end of contrast in all of the darker images because we tend to see blue and magenta the least in this. And digital cameras, if there's going to be noise in a file anywhere, it's going to be in the blue channel. Yeah. So another way to look at this is red holds the upper end of contrast, green holds midtone structure, and blue holds the lower end of contrast. You put them all together, you get RGB. Right. All right. So let's go to QSAT. Does this meet our definition? Yes. All right. Let's take a look at the channels. That's a red channel. That's a blue channel. Or that's green, rather. Green channel, and that's a blue channel. Right. What do you notice between these? Do you see any change as I do this? Well, yeah, it's, it's the same thing as, as when you had the color grid. You know, it, it, when you totally remove saturation, it, it doesn't take into account the differences in those color channels. <clears throat> no, so what I've done is I've successfully destroyed two-thirds of the file's data, and the only thing that I've accomplished is when I put all three together, I get some density back. Mm -hmm. Now, but I meet my definition. So the problem is, if we look at what film did, we picked different film types based on what the application of the image's requirements were. What I'm going to talk about is a way in which to make um, something called a tonal reproduction curve. That's what you're looking at when you're looking at film, T uh, TRC. Mm -hmm. And that I'm going to show you a way to make a image-specific tonal reproduction curve that can be image structure-specific. So you can pick the way in which the blue channel sees certain structures in the image, the red channel sees certain structures in the image, and the green channel sees certain structure in the image. And you can isolate that, the lips, the hair, the eyes, the face in this image. So you can control using color what this image will do. Sounds good. That's my theory of black and white, which is why it comes back down to what matters most is that you have an incredible color image. And when you look at the image, the color gets in the way of the image. For example, here, this is a pretty color image, but it's not near as nice as the black and white. Mm -hmm. So what I want to do is I want to control the color. Now, let's get back to opposite day. Let me show you something else. Equal values of red, green, and blue. So I'm going to fill this with black or white, call this W. So here is white, that's black, call that B. And we'll fill this one with 128, 128, 128, middle gray. Now, what I'm gonna do, those are equal values of red, green, and blue. I'm gonna set these all to the color blend mode. And what you should see occur is that 
equal values of red, green, and blue produce gray. And no matter what I do to this image, no matter which one I click, so long as they are equal values of red, green, and blue, I will produce gray. Mm -hmm. Now, back to opposite day. If it matters most, color management matters the most with regards to black and white conversion, which makes no sense at all on the surface. Right. It, okay, so I take a picture of you, you're wearing a red shirt. All we know is that it's a red. We don't know if it's that red, but we sure do know if it's a gray or not. Let me show you. I'm gonna click on my middle gray again, and I'm gonna move the green three points. I'm gonna fill this layer with that color. What happened to the image? Uh, I think I had was looking away the minute you filled it or the second you filled it, so I'm not necessarily sure I right. saw the transition. So here's, new, here's 128, 128, 128. Here is me adding just three points of, of color. Ah, yes. Okay, it's not a gray. It's a neutral green, but it's not a gray. Right. So if color, manage, color management matters anywhere, calibrating your monitor, it matters most with regards to neutral gray. We don't know if it's what red it is or what yellow it is. We just know that it's a red, a yellow, a green, or a blue. But we sure as heck know that it's a gray or not. Yes, easy to see. Right, so just three points. Not a big move. No. So with that, the first thing you want to do when you're working in the chromatic grayscale and digital is you need to ca calibrate your monitor. Now, let's take a look at, let's do this, Command J. Let's create a series of <coughs> images to look at. So we agree on this. I'm going to duplicate this image three times, and I'm going to go grayscale using Photoshop's grayscale. Duplicate this image again. Call this LAB1. Duplicate it one more time. Call this LAB2. So let's start with. Simply taking our global desaturation we're going to create a comparison so this right. is global desaturation let's go to convert to grayscale so we're going to go to image mode grayscale what I want you to do is watch this number down here Okay, so my document size is 30.1 megabytes. With me? Yeah, but one, one thing uh, I wanted to mention first is that uh, the hue saturation layer is still present in that layer. Is that, did you want to have that in there? Or not? You're right. Thank you. Because otherwise it'll just give us the same as the global DSAT. All right, so let's go to grayscale, convert to grayscale. Right. Okay, discard color information. Oops. Let's go here, convert to grayscale. What I want you to look at is this number down here. Right, the file right. size. Okay, discard, what happened to it? A third of the size. So I lost two thirds of the files data. Right. That's evil. Three channels down to one channel. Correct. Now, watch what happens when I, oops, get you out of here. Just drag my convert to grayscale over here. I get all of the file data back. See where this is at 30.1, but mm -hmm. none, I lose all of the relational data. And by relational data, can you clarify what you mean by that? What I mean by that is the, the relationship between red, green, and blue. Oh, okay, right. 
Okay. So the differences I've lost. So I have all of the file size, but none of the benefit of having red, green, and blue. That's what a digital camera would do. It'll take the green channel and put it in the red and the blue. Right. Okay. So we're going to go convert to grayscale. But let's go to lab conversion one. What I'm going to do is again, what I want you to watch is what happens down here. I'm going to go to image, right, image mode, lab color. You see any change? Uh, no. Okay. Let's look at the channels. This is the L channel, lightness. That meets my definition, right? Is yes. that, that's usable data, correct? I would say so, yes. Is that usable? <laughs> Not by most people's standards, although I could see some creative people coming up with something, but, but no, I would say. Well, actually, no, it, it is usable data, but by itself, visually, it's probably not usable data in terms of what most people are expecting to see. Correct, or that. So for the ease of use, for looking, the, the eternal quest in digital photography, looking for the easy button, can, is there anything that human perception can get out of this? Um, well, well not, not what we're used to seeing. Uh, I mean, what are you, what are you referring to? Were you, were you referring to, you were just clicking on the A and the B, so I didn't know what you were referring to there. All right, let's look at the channels here. Is there something that when I look at this, I can use? I would say so. How about here? Yes. How about here? Uh, yes, uh, you know, it, it's di different, uh, but, but certainly yes. You could right. use so You can look at it and you go, oh, I want this aspect of the blue. I want this aspect of the green. I want this aspect of the red. Right. Over here, um, I have no idea what aspect of A star or B star that I want. Yeah, it's, it's not easily gotten to. So, well, it's, it's, it's not, I would say, you're right. It's not easily perceived right off the bat by us looking at it. You and I both know there is interesting data in there that potentially we might use, but visually it's not uh, uh, accessible to us. Right. It's not, it's not predictable. Yeah. Okay, so... And then we have color if I put these together. So if I do what is referred to as the classic black and white conversion, which is because it's logarithmic, it therefore replicates film. If I go to image mode, grayscale, or actually no, we'll do it the first way. The first way is I'm gonna throw away A star. I'm gonna throw away B star. And just to clarify here, uh, we're working in the channels panel of a LAB image. What happened here? We are, uh, we have removed all of the color information that have been contained in the A and the B channels. We are left with only the luminance information. Correct. So now I have to convert to grayscale and then I will convert back to RGB. So I get, again, all of the headroom of the file but none of the benefits of that file. Mm -hmm. So we'll call this LAB1. So let's drag this over here. All right, so let's put this up here. So now I have LabSat over here, we can close out of this. Now let's go to the neoclassic black and white conversion. And what this one says is I'm going to go to, and this more replicates film, according to its definition. I'm gonna to go to image mode lab color. Again, no difference here. Mm -hmm. Image mode, grayscale. Big difference here. Right, file image, size is one third. Right, image mode, RGB. And we'll call this, LAB or two. So these are the big ways of doing this. This is the one that many, 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 many big deal photographers show off because it's supposed to replicate the way in which film records because film is 
logarithmic. So let's take a look. This is lab two. This is lab one. They meet the definition, but do they agree? They're two different things. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is lab one, and this is convert to grayscale. Now let's. So can we can, can we just let's just pause for a second and and uh, quickly summarize again. How do you arrived at both at the lab one version and the lab two version? Lab one was I converted the image to LAB color space. Yes. I re I discarded the A and B channel, converted to grayscale, converted to RGB. Okay, great. L lab two was I converted it to LAB, converted it to grayscale, converted it to RGB. Ah, uh, right. So you 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 essentially the, really going into LAB uh, in, in that one was sort of pointless because right after it you converted it to grayscale and you lost. Correct. Let me show you what convert to grayscale does between lab two and convert to grayscale. Do you see a difference? No. That's because Photoshop does it that way automatically. So the second one is just busy work. Right. Now, this is the difference between convert to grayscale and desaturation. Get back here. Okay. And this is the difference between lab and desaturation. Believe it or not, in cosmic reality, just removing all the color from an RGB document gets you closer than doing it in the lab color space. Mm -hmm. So lab, and I use it all the time for my color work for enhancing saturation and stuff, is great for color, but it's not great so great for chromatic grayscale. Because it dumps two thirds of the data and all I get is the luminance of lab and I lose the relationship between red, green and blue. And, and so do you have a, a preferred, I mean, I realize that this is, is a, a question that probably is best answered on a per image basis, but, um, you know, do you have a preferred method that, that, that you like to use? for converting to grayscale or again, is it just too hard to pin down because it's based more on what's happening in each individual image? I do have a preferred method. Let me show you first off, let me get out of this. This is what lab would do to this test. One lab two. Do you see the difference? Yes. Okay. This is the, the black and white adjustment layer default. To get out of here. Okay, so black and white adjustment layer does not reconcile with lab one or two, and it doesn't reconcile with anything. So what we have is we have an issue. I can get to black and white or chromatic grayscale a billion different ways, but what I want is control. Here's why, and then I will show you a simple technique invented by Russell Brown called film and filter that you can do. Now the theory is my preferred theory, I do the same thing with film and filter, but I use three, or actually four Silver FX Pro um, adjustment layers, which is the last chapter of my book. Okay. Now, let's take a look at this image right here. Let me see if I can get this to show me. Come on. Now, if we look at this, this, these two grays are the same. Do we agree? Uh, they appear to be the same to me, although, you know, <laughs> um, there's always these optical illusion things that throw us off. So now we have, you see my sample points? I do. Here, here, here. Okay, so positions one, two, and three are on gray, and position four is on um, white. And if we look at those, they record, they report 128, 128, 128, and 255 and 255. Now, if I remove those, they're still the same gray, correct? Uh, yes, appears to be. And measurement says they are. When I introduce black, what happens? Which one's lighter? Well, I would say that, uh, I mean, I, I know that none of them are lighter, 
that the gray is the, the gray is the same, although the gray on the left appears to be lighter. And the gray to the right appears to be darker. That's correct. Okay. So understanding how to control light and dark and understanding how to control contrast and understanding how to control image structure based off of red, green, and blue matters most in chromatic grayscale because of something called white's illusion, which is what I'm showing you. Mm -hmm. That measurement, precision measurement says that these are the same grays. Accurate observation says that they are different. Yes. So there's a difference between precision and accuracy. Yes. All right, so let's take a look. I don't need this one anymore. At same illusion. This appears to be a light gray, but when I put this into white, it appears to be darker. Right. Now watch what happens to the gray. It appears that the gray that's solid based on the grayscale ramp behind it is that the left side is darker, the right side is lighter. Yes. Again, by having ownership of the color and controlling the color of the image, you win. So by having control of the red, green, and blue channels, gives you greater control over the image. Now that I've gone through all of this nonsense, let me show you how this works. This was originally invented by Russell Brown. And good old Dr. Brown came up with this. One. Go on. I was just going to say, Dr. Brown was a, a, a guest on The Fix um, for our Halloween show. Oh, how appropriate. <laughs> yes, yes. We, we did a show on making monsters. How appropriate. He is one of the most brilliant people I have ever had the fortune to meet. Yes, yes. He is now, always interesting. And has forgotten more about Photoshop than you and I will ever know. And this is true. Now, what, what I'm going to do that. is I'm going to remove all the color from the image. Hue saturation, yep. Okay, I'm going to create another hue sat layer and i'm going to call this film one now do you see let me put this in the color blend mode too do you see any difference when i do this uh no so if i move the hue around nothing happens no correct that's Which, because your blend mode is set to normal. Correct. Now, let me, sh let me show you why. Um, this has to do with something, you can tell I went to graduate school already. The philosopher Soren Kierkegaard said, which is we, <laughs> we live life forwards, but frequently we, re we perceive it backwards. And the same thing happens here when we discuss technique. We look at it from the top down, not the bottom up. So... Mm -hmm you'll hear discussions about how contrast matters and color has no matter whatsoever with regards to grayscale conversion. Let me make this into a curves adjustment layer. Watch, because if I do this, this has impact, right? Yes. Okay, so that has impact, whereas this has no impact. Mm-hmm. Watch what happens when I put this underneath this adjustment layer. What do you see happen? Well, now the, uh, the tonal relationships uh, between um, the colors in the image are changing because you're changing the hue. Right, because color is made up of three things, hue, saturation, and lightness, or brightness, HSL or HSB. Right. Hue is hue, saturation is saturation, is lightness is lightness. And hue is not lightness, saturation is not hue, and lightness is neither saturation or hue. There are three elements that make up color. So, with this, if I can control the color, and let's take a look at this. I'm going to do this where you see how, how I move this determines a difference? Yes. So, I'm going to just simply type in what I already know the answer to be for this. So I'm going to go minus 146 for hue on one and saturation 29. 
What do you see happen here? Uh, it's looking uh, very dark and kind of muddy. And if I look at the color, it's very blue. Right. Okay. So now I'm going to create a second one. Let's turn this off. Call this film two. Oh, I see what you're doing. You're going to be doing, you're, you're sort of replicating RGB channels. Right. But what I can do is I can control these. I can pick what it is that I want from this. So that what I have here is I now, let's take a look at that. I have a red. And we'll do this one more time. Turn this off. Call this film three. And here, what I will do is over here, come to Papa. Four. Okay, and if I look at this, so what I have is a red, a green, and a blue. Right. What I can do is I can look at this and I like what it does here for the face and the lips. See what happens to the lips. I really like what this does for the shadow and I really like what this does for skin tone. So what I'm going to do is come in B, set my brush to 50%. So you've inverted the layer mask to black and now you're painting in uh, with white at 50% opacity to reveal the effect of that layer. Correct. I'm going to come in here. And I'm just going to do this quick so that we can see it. Now, here's the first question. Did you see the image in black and white? No, I saw it in color. Let's go back to film. You're when talking you about you're talking about when you photographed it, you mean? Right. The three questions I get. Did you see the image in black and white? How come my black and whites look better than yours? And can you teach me how to see in black and white? Mm -hmm. Are the three questions I most frequently get asked. When we put film into a camera and it was black and white film, when you look through the viewfinder, did you see the image in color or black and white? Color. Okay. So your decisions were made off of color. So the first thing is, let me ask you, do you see color this way? Do you see an image that way? Uh, well, I see that image that way now. I, I don't see color that way normally unless I've, you know, uh, ha had some strange cocktails. But uh. ex ex Exactly. So my, <laughs> my, point, my point here is the answer to the first question is, do you see the image in black and white? No, because for me to see the image in black and white would require that I saw the color image this way. Yeah. Okay. Now, how come my black and whites look better than yours? Because I approach them as a color image. For me, black and white is not a afterthought. It's the only thought that you have to create an incredible color image first and then convert to black and white. You don't go, oh, it didn't work in color, so I'll just take all the color out of it. No, it has to be an incredible color image. And can I teach you to see in black and white? You tell me. Well, I will say that, you know, there are, there are some scenes that... Um when I look at them, I know, I know that based on what I can do in the digital darkroom, I, I know that certain scenes will end, end up being a really good black and white image because I know how I can manipulate the data. But, you know, that's just sort of more a knowing what I can do down the road. So for me, what it comes down to is um, I have never taken a black and an image that's been a black and white that I didn't know at moment of capture that it was going to be a black and white. Because the gesture is so strong in that image that it just, it's a black and white image or chromatic grayscale. Mm -hmm. 
Now, do I agree with you? Some scenes lend themselves more to others. Yeah, they do. For example, that picture of the Golden Gate Bridge. I knew the moment I took it that that was not going to be a color image. Right. Why? Well, because I, I had a blue ball sky. Yeah. Also, you know, uh, way b long before I ever got involved with digital, you know, this is before digital cameras were really a viable thing. Uh, when I was uh, traveling, I would frequently travel with two camera bodies, one loaded with color film and one loaded with black and white because at, you know, there were just some scenes I'd see and I go, Oh, that's a black and white picture. And I would shoot it with the black and white camera. Right. And I mean, I, I got into color in the digital domain. Um, when Epson and Nikon both said to me that to have a continued relationship with them, I had better start shooting color. <laughs> I, I shot over 6,000 rolls of film a year doing Hollywood all in black and white. So I didn't get into color realistically until 1995. And um, that was because if I wanted to be part of the Epson beta program and I was blessed to be their first beta tester and part of Nikon's program, I was blessed to be their first beta site that I would, I'd start shooting color because most people at that time wanted color. Now here's a trippy thing, right? Back in the day of film, color was the issue and black and white was totally dominant. We had perfect black and white film and color film was the problem. Mm -hmm. With digital, everybody now wants to do black and white because they want to go back in the day and black and white has been the issue, which we've now perfected in the last five years that we produce superior output in black and white than we could ever produce in film because there is no cadmium. There is no zinc. There is no tin. And in some instances, there's almost no silver in the paper. So you can't get the tonal range that Ansel Adams could get. That can't be gotten. So, mm -hmm you can't go back in the day to what you fell in love with, which is most likely a black and white image. For me, I fell in love with black and white photography. So what we can do now is we can do something better. Yeah. Um, let's see the silver paper, I think, and I'm a little soft in these numbers. I don't remember exactly. I think it was 151 levels of gradation. Sounds roughly correct. Got, I, have it, I have it written in my book, so I'm going to give me a little wiggle room. Um, and the zone system accounts for 10 zones. We have 14 stops of dynamic range. That means that 10 zones is 10,000 levels of gradation. So how do you put 10,000 levels of gradation, which is what the zone system calls for, onto 150-ish levels of gradation in which silver paper can do? All right. It's impossible. Okay, that's, it's impossible. That's why the zone system was invented so that you could move the grays around. An inspired idea. Mm -hmm. um, now, digital has 14 stops of dynamic range or 18,600 and something levels of gradation. And, and inkjet paper can do 313, 331, somewhere in there, levels of gradation. So again, we have more dynamic range than the output, paper, the output can produce but we have more gradation than silver paper could do. So where do you want to be? All right, right. The difference is one of aesthetics. Do I like the metallic look of silver paper? If that is what your aesthetic is, I will defend you to the death. <laughs> if you tell me that my aesthetic is screwed because I shoot digital, um, yeah, you know, I'm going to be one of the dark lords of photography. So, it's, it's that. It's what is the aesthetic call? What is my visual sensibility say? But from a practitioner standpoint, you can get way more stuff out of a digital image than you ever could out of silver. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And, you know, photography has always been about, you know, the tools and the technology changing and, and photographers adapting uh, to those new tools and technology and, and making the most of it. You know, that's Andal did that. And that's what we're doing these days with with digital tools. Which is, we go, back, we go back to that quote, Ansel's quote. That's exactly what he said. We adapt exactly. to it, and he wishes he could be around to play with it. Yeah, yeah. And, and so, you know, I, I guess the overarching thing is the last quote that I'd like to leave on, which is Mies van der Rohe, the architect. An interesting plainness is the most difficult thing to achieve. 
And in black and white photography, that's really what you're after is you're after taking something that you walk by photographing it in such a way that when you look at it, when somebody else sees that object, they'll see your photograph, then that object that you like the best advice Maisel ever gave and gave me, which is he looked at my pictures once and he said, the problem with your photography is you walk too fast. (laughs) And it's like, I walk too fast. It's like, slow down, you know, take it in, be taken by the picture. Don't take the picture. Mm -hmm. And you know, and again, that applies to color and black and white and in digital, as we've seen color and black and white are the same thing. Right. Right. Excellent. Well, lots of great information, Vincent, and thanks so much for for stopping by to share it. I know I picked up uh, some new concepts and uh, also some uh, uh, concepts that I was familiar with, but the way that you presented them was just really great and uh, uh, very, very useful. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. I mean, I guess sitting here in the ivory tower, I got nothing better to do but drink coffee and, and pontificate about stuff. So... <laughs> Well, so, uh, uh, so so you've got uh, you've got the uh, the Cuba workshop coming up in in April. That was it, April, right? March, March, March eighteenth. And is that a uh, a week long, like a week long trip to Cuba? Yeah, it's a, it's a week long. It's uh, I think it's nine days, one uh, two days travel, and then uh, a weekish six days to to get there. So six or nine days. Um, or should say, uh, go on. I was going to say, and then you also have, uh, you said, a, a black and white workshop at Palm Beach Photographic Workshops? I do. I have a black and white workshop scheduled at Palm Beach Photographic Center um, the tail end of February. Okay. And so where can people find you uh, on the web and, and find out more about your workshops and your books and stuff like that? Uh, VersaceFotography.com. If uh, somebody has a question, send me an email at Vincent at VersacePhotography.com. If you can't remember my email address, type in my name. If you can't remember my name, uh... <laughs> <laughs> can't help them. Can't help you can't there. Help <laughs> That's just the way I roll. <laughs> there you go. Uh, well, cool, cool, excellent. I'll, I'll put those in the show notes for people to uh, click on if they want to come to the page. Uh, and anyway, it'll be great seeing you. Uh, next week slash later tonight, depending on uh, how the time zone thing goes. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm looking forward to it. I mean, it'll be fun. I'm looking forward to being in Florida where it won't be as wet as it has been here in Los Angeles, which we're all happy about how wet it is. We are. We are don't, doing the happy don't, dance. Don't get me wrong. Um, but, yeah, the dance that I've had to go through because of weather um, has just been – traveling has been a nightmare because we're just not used to it. No, no, no. You know, this, this, this water falling from the sky concept is just, this is not known to our people. <laughs> yes. Just, the ancient legends speak of it, but <laughs> yes, it's like, times. <laughs> perhaps it's end times. Oh my God. No, <laughs> that, that's what those, those giant stone statues with the stone umbrellas. That's what they must mean. <laughs> I, I, I wondered what that, what that thing was above them. I and, know, yes. I know. It all becomes clear. Well, cool. Well, anyway, thank you so much, Vincent, for for stopping by and uh, sharing um, your expertise in black and white with us. I do appreciate that. Great conversation. Thank you for having me. So, and thank you for tuning in and joining us on The Fix. Uh, remember, you can always subscribe to the iTunes audio version uh, on iTunes, or you can go to the uh, video version, which you can find at thisweekinphoto.com slash the fix. And there's also a link to an audio version there you can download as well. I'm Sean Duggan. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on the fix. Mm-hmm.